Another NFL season has ended with Tom Brady hoisting the Lombardi Trophy, except this time he did it without the New England Patriots and Bill Belichick. I've gotten a lot of shit from Brady fans who believe I've been proven wrong about my previous Tom Brady takes that he's an overrated system quarterback. But here's the thing. Everything I've said about Tom Brady wasn't disproven in the 2020 season. It was reinforced. This video takes a look at how Tom Brady is still the most overrated player in sports history. After weaseling his way out of his contract with the Patriots, Tom Brady was looking for a super talented team that was on the cusp of breaking out. Luckily for him, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers were on the market for a new QB. The Bucs were coming off of a season where they went 7-9, and nine, so they were obviously terrible and the almighty savior Tom Brady single-handedly made them a good team again, right? Wrong. The Buccaneers finished 7-9 and nine despite their quarterback throwing a historic amount of interceptions. In 2019, Jameis Winston threw nine more interceptions than any other player and was the first player since Vinny Testaverde in 1988, also with Tampa Bay, to throw 30 plus interceptions in a season. Even with all of Jameis's interceptions, the 2019 Bucks were still a few plays away from winning double digit games. They lost 32 to 31 to the Giants when their kicker missed a chip shot field goal as time expired. They also had fourth quarter leads in a 27 23 loss to the Titans, a 28 22 overtime loss to the Falcons, and had tie games in the fourth quarter during their 23 to 20 loss to Houston and 40 to 34 overtime loss to Seattle. The 2019 Buccaneers offense finished 9th in points per drive and 11th in yards per drive. And despite all his turnovers, Jameis Winston finished with over 5100 yards and 33 touchdowns. The point being, this Buccaneers team was much better than their record and also very talented. All they needed was a quarterback that didn't throw a historical amount of interceptions to get them over the top. Brady knew this, and he also knew his dumbass fan base would give him full credit for turning the franchise around. It was a win-win situation for him. It's also worthy to note that when Brady became the Buccaneers starting QB in March 2020, the world was in the beginning of a global pandemic. This is interesting because the last time Brady became a starting QB for an NFL team in September 2001, the world was fresh off of 9-11. Is it a coincidence that terrible things happen to the world whenever Brady joins a new team? Is he the Antichrist? One can only wonder. Brady was the only former Patriots player to go to Tampa in the 2020 offseason. Human golden retriever Rob Gronkowski ended his one-year retirement to join Tom in the Sunshine State, and Tom's personal trainer slash scam artist Alex Guerrero also migrated south with Brady to make sure he magically continues to not look like a guy in his mid-40s. This video won't spend too much time going over the regular season. The Bucks finished 11-5 and and Brady statistically had a monster year, as he should have, considering he was in the best situation imaginable for a quarterback. He threw the ball deeper than ever before, which is surprising to nobody who knows anything about a Bruce Arians offense. After Drew Brees, Brady had the second most efficient season among NFC South quarterbacks over the age of 40 that attended a Big Ten school. He threw for over 4,600 yards and 40 touchdowns, but as always, Brady wasn't as impressive as his stats would indicate. He heavily inflated his numbers in 10 games against non-playoff teams and was horrendous in 6 games against playoff teams, throwing 10 touchdowns and 9 interceptions as the Bucks went 1-5. Further supporting my Brady's luck agenda was the defensive support and starting field position Brady received. The Buccaneers defense finished 6th in both yards and points allowed per drive, and the team finished 4th in average starting field position. This has been the story of Brady's entire career, having defenses that keep the score down and leeching off of short fields. These are two overlooked but vitally important components for why Brady has had the most team success other top quarterbacks like Rodgers, Breeze, and Peyton didn't have. But for as great as the Bucks' supporting cast around Brady was in the regular season, they would make his life even easier in the playoffs. The Buccaneers, despite all of their talent, did not win the NFC South, and therefore, for the first time in Tom Brady's entire career, he had to go on the road for an opening playoff game. And in a shock to absolutely nobody with brain cells, despite not winning his division, Brady got to face a team with a losing record in his first playoff game. The luck never ends with this bastard. Anyway, despite having a losing record, Washington did have a legitimately great defense, at least 
they did during the regular season. Washington also had to start little-known Taylor Heineke at quarterback after Alex Smith's leg almost fell off again. In a shock, Heineke actually played well and led the normally terrible Washington offense to a respectable 23 points. It was the much bollyhooed Washington defense that failed to show up. Brady had a monster statistical game and his stats easily could have been better if not for some drops by wide open receivers. This was by far Brady's most impressive game of the 2020 playoffs, but even then it wasn't that impressive to watch. The Buccaneers offensive line did a great job of giving Brady time and Brady's receivers were running free all over the field all game long. I'm not going to say Brady was bad because he wasn't, but I'm not going to ball wash a guy for beating a losing team with Taylor Heineke quarterback in the playoffs. He did what he was supposed to do. The Buccaneers divisional round matchup against the Saints is when Brady's luck went into full effect. The Saints had destroyed the Buccaneers twice during the regular season, and even as somebody who always expects Brady to win in the playoffs, I was hopeful the Saints could do the job again. There were plenty of opportunities for the Saints to break this game open, and in typical Brady's luck fashion, they failed to do so. The Bucs offense went three and out on its first two drives, but instead of capitalizing with touchdowns, the Saints settled for two field goals to only gain a 6-0 lead. The story of the rest of the game was simple. The Saints had four turnovers while the Buccaneers had none. Drew Brees, who had been underrated in the playoffs over his career, had his first truly awful playoff game ever, throwing three INTs and looking absolutely washed. The Buccaneers had three touchdown drives in this game, two were off of Brees' interceptions, and the third was off of a back-breaking fumble by Jared Cook with the Saints up 20-13 midway through the third quarter, with a chance to take control of the game for good. The first Buccaneers touchdown drive was three yards. The second was 40 yards, and the third was 20 yards. This was only the third time over the last 20 years where a team had three touchdown drives of 40 yards or less in a playoff game. The first team was the 2005 Broncos against Brady's Patriots, and the second was Brady's Patriots against the Colts in the infamous Deflategate game. But if you call Brady lucky, you're just a hater, right? Yeah. Brady, as he's done for most of his career, won the game despite playing horrendous. He only had a respectable stat line due to leeching off off of the ridiculously great field position his defense gave him. In addition, the Saints dropped multiple horrific Brady throws that should have been picked off. The only real highlight of the game was Jameis Winston coming in and throwing a 56-yard touchdown on a trick play. Jameis now has more 50-yard touchdown passes in the playoffs since 2012 than Brady does on one career attempt. The amount of ball washing Brady got for winning this game was so disgusting I needed a barf bag afterwards. But the worst was yet to come, unfortunately. The NFC champion championship matchup between the Tampa Bay Brady Nears and Green Bay Packers had the potential to be legendary, and it ended up being tragic. I honestly don't know where to start. This was an extremely winnable game for Green Bay, who finally had a home NFC championship game with Aaron Rodgers under center. Unfortunately, there were many miscues and fuck-ups along the way that robbed Rodgers, who just won NFL MVP for the third time, of winning a game he certainly played well enough to win. Kevin King, the atrocious Packers cornerback, single-handed cost the team 14 points with his disgusting play. From his comically mistimed jump on a third down touchdown pass on the opening drive, to letting little Scotty Miller score a touchdown on the final play of the first half where all he had to do was fucking keep the guy in front of him, goddammit, to the end of the game where he got called for a season losing pass interference on a throw that Brady airmailed. Chandon Sullivan, I don't know if I'm even saying his name right, but he's a scrub, so fuck him, dropped an absolute gift of an interception from Brady a few plays before the Scotty Miller touchdown. Darnell Savage also let Chris Godwin bitch him on a YOLO throw from Brady in the second quarter that went for 52 yards and set up a Leonard Fournette touchdown run. But going into this game, everybody knew that outside of Jair Alexander, the Packers secondary was a weak point. What was surprising was the Packers' star players and star unit that made them so formidable, letting them down when it mattered most. Aaron Jones was terrible, committing two fumbles, the last of which set up the Buccaneers with an 8-yard touchdown drive to extend their lead to 28-10 early in the third quarter. The offensive line, which admittedly was missing all-pro left tackle David Bakhtiari, completely collapsed at the worst times, giving Rodgers no protection. Even all-pro wide receiver Devontae Adams had his miscues, dropping a touchdown pass in the second quarter that would have tied the game at 14. As for Aaron Rodgers, he was great in this game, despite what morons will say. Almost 350 yards passing, three touchdown passes, and his interception came on a play where there was obvious holding on Bucks defensive back Sean Murphy Bunting. Rodgers took criticism for his play in the fourth quarter and not taking advantage of several Brady interceptions, but his offensive line was 
completely overwhelmed. Rodgers was not perfect, and he might have missed an opportunity or two near the goal line on some throws, but he certainly deserved to win this game more than Brady did. Brady, keeping in tradition with the rest of his career, won a conference championship game where he played terrible. He threw three interceptions and honestly should have had a few more. His aforementioned duck that Chandon Sullivan dropped was the worst, but his YOLO ball to Godwin could have easily been picked as well. He threw three touchdowns, sure, but the first one was a pass that Kevin King should have swatted down, the second was after he should have been picked off, and his third was on an eight-yard drive to a wide-open tight end, with multiple offensive linemen downfield, which should have been a penalty. Even as a Brady hater, I've rarely seen him as careless with the ball as he was in the second half of this game. There's not much left to say, really. We all saw Brady play atrocious, we all saw Brady get bailed out by his defense in the second half, and we all saw the penalties the Bucks defensive backs got away with on the Packers receivers. It really felt like this was Aaron Rodgers' year to get back to the Super Bowl, and once again, because of his shitty teammates, he wasn't able to. The most incredible stat that I took away from this game was how Tom Brady has a better record in playoff games with three interceptions than Aaron Rodgers does in playoff games with three touchdowns. This was the second time Brady has won a conference championship game with three interceptions. I could go on and on, but everything I've said about him for years was proven correct in real time. I was so discouraged by this game that I didn't really care about the Super Bowl, or so I thought. Super Bowl 55 was a rematch of an entertaining regular season bout between the defending Super Bowl champion Kansas City Chiefs and Tom Brady's team. Coming into the game, I expected the Chiefs to win because of my faith in Patrick Mahomes, and looking back, I should have known better. Because once you pick against Brady's luck in a playoff game, you get shit like Super Bowl 55. What transpired on the field in Tampa Bay is still hard for me to understand, and that's right. Tom Brady became the first quarterback to ever start a Super Bowl at his team's home stadium. But not lucky, guys. He's not lucky. The story of the game was this. The Buccaneers' defense held a Patrick Mahomes-led offense to nine points. That's it. Everything else is secondary. Brady, of course, won Super Bowl MVP for throwing for 201 yards and three touchdowns. But it's one of the most misleading stat lines ever. For starters, Brady only threw for 72 air yards and completed just five throws over five yards in the air. He was barely pressured all game long and he didn't have to do anything remotely difficult. But Barry, he threw three touchdowns. How can you say he played bad? On his first touchdown drive, Brady completed one throw beyond the line of scrimmage. His second touchdown drive was a doozy. It was 38 yards where he had an interception negated on a shitty penalty, then went three and out on his second chance just to get a third chance after the Chiefs lined up offsides on a field goal. Yes, the Chiefs once again lined up offsides against Tom Brady in a pivotal moment in a playoff game. Still think he's not lucky? Once getting his third chance, Brady had all day long in a pocket to throw to a wide open Gronkowski in the end zone. It was absolutely fucking disgusting. But it wasn't as disgusting as the third touchdown drive for Brady. Right before the end of the half, Brady benefited from 42 penalty yards on two flags that shouldn't have been thrown. The first flag was incidental contact, and the second flag was obviously an uncatchable pass. Long story short, the drive ended with Brady throwing a one-yard touchdown to Antonio Brown. Isn't it great to see good people succeed? In the second half, Brady did nothing, because he really didn't have to. The Bucks' defense completely shut down the Chiefs' offense in a way that hadn't been done before in the Patrick Mahomes era. Coming into this game, there was concern that the Chiefs' offensive line would be in trouble due to missing their two starting tackles, but nobody, even the most optimistic Brady supporters, could have seen the level of domination the Bucks' defensive line administered. It really did look as though Mahomes, who was battling a foot injury, was playing a completely different sport than Brady. According to the folks at ESPN, Mahomes was pressured on 29 of his 56 dropbacks, good for 52% of his total dropbacks. That's the most pressures against any quarterback in Super Bowl history. Brady, on the other hand, was pressured on just four of his 30 dropbacks, which is just 13%. Because Mahomes is a freak show, he still avoided countless sacks and gave his receivers multiple chances for scores that were dropped. In the end, the Bucks won a snoozer 31-9, and Brady won his seventh ring. If I had to compare the 2020 NFL season to anything, it would be Game of Thrones. There were so many great moments and so many potentially incredible endings 
to be had, all for it to go out in the worst way possible to the point where nobody will be talking about it in a few years. Well, nobody except Brady Tarts. If you're still not convinced that Tom Brady is the most overrated player in sports history and believe I'm still just a blind hater, I don't know what more to tell you. Everything I said about Brady in the past, how he always has elite defenses, great starting field position, great kicking, and freak occurrences in the playoffs going his way to help him win, literally all happened again in 2020 with Tampa Bay. And that's not even saying anything about the tons of skill position talent he's played with over his career. Just to drive the point home even further, here are some eye-opening stats about Brady's career and the Buccaneers' 2020 postseason that really quantify just how lucky and overrated Tom Brady is.